conservation is, does not have to be the realm of the professional with the PhD from the Yale School of Forestry. Every act of conservation matters, whether it's me planting a milkweed for monarch on my balcony in Washington, DC, or somebody moving to native landscaping on their corporate campuses. Every act matters. <laughs> Margaret O'Gorman is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Margaret O'Gorman operates at the intersection of business and nature. As president of the Wildlife Habitat Council, she helps companies find value in natural resources, conservation, and mainstream biodiversity across operations. She highlights the problems of too much planning and not enough action. She is a proponent of simplifying approaches to conservation and open, opening the door to efforts that restore broken places, enhance existing ecosystems, and return healthy biodiversity to all places. She has spoken at Business and Biodiversity Forum at the Convention on Biological Diversity, COP13, the Smithsonian Institute Conservation Optimism Summit, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, Cement Sustainability Initiative, and Ireland's National Biodiversity Conference. Her new book, which I have right here, Strategic Corporate Conservation and Planning, a Guide to Meaningful Engagement, was published February 2020, last year, and I'm so glad to have you on the show, Margaret, welcome. Thank you so much, I'm glad to be here. It, it's wonderful, our, our paths have kind of crossed over the years in, in a distant way, um, not only through conservation, but in speaking engagements. You've spoken at the Green Biz uh, before events and, and written some, had some different type of articles published online based on your work. Um, Years ago, I, I used to be the director over uh, health, safety, and environment for a major energy company, rolling out some new renewable energy work and dealt a lot with conservation in the United States, making sure that uh, organic farms, wildlife habitats for eagles and turtles and many other species were not encroached in, on uh, in this energy work and um, followed really what you've been doing for a long time through the Wildlife Habitat Council. And, and um, it's really wonderful to have you here on the show today. Because you've been doing this such a long time, uh, we've just made it through and, and you probably don't wanna talk about it like the rest of us don't wanna talk about it. Um, through this crazy time, Black Lives Matter, the pandemic, we're still in lockdown here in uh, Hamburg, Germany and, and different parts of the world, we're still experiencing mutations, um, uh, racism against uh, Asian people and uh, all sorts of other global problems. Brexit comes to, uh, along with it, Bolsonaro, the burning rainforest, the brush fires from <clears throat> Australia, on and on. The list just never seems to end. Um, but I want to know, how have you weathered all this crazy time, this at least last 12 months with lockdown and that has the conservation and the, the models and the corporate planning that you, you talk about, given you and your organization and those that you work with more resilience, a better operating model to weather these hard times? And what are anything that maybe has bubbled to the surface that are aha moments or moments of learning that you could depart to us that maybe we could take away to learn from as well how to make it through these difficult times? Sure, that's a great question. And that is a serious litany of global problems that you just listed there. The last 12 months has seen silver linings as well as challenges. And as an NGO executive, I am a bright side thinker. So I usually focus on the silver linings rather than the challenges because they're always there. 
one of the things that we saw that was really heartening to us is that the conservation projects that were being done on corporate lands continued to be managed even when the corporate facilities had restricted access. And we believe that that's because of the relationship between the employees on the ground and the work that they are doing, that they have these great ownerships in these projects that helped them innovate and pivot to be able to maintain the projects even when they, the access to the site was limited to essential workers only. We had a site, um, Bacardi site, in Jacksonville, Florida, that moved their entire conservation project to an area of less um, traffic of people so that they could actually engage in a socially distant way. We had people creating timetables to allow them to access their sites. So we saw this great innovation of people who really wanted to continue doing what they were doing when they really weren't supposed to be there. And that's kind of a thread that goes through a lot of our work is the innovation of the employees um, moving ahead with these projects despite structures around them that may have tried to stop them. Oh, I love that. That's, that's fabulous to hear. Did, did you receive calls or notices or um, emails from people during this time, corporations saying, boy, we, we should have listened to you guys in the past. We really haven't, haven't. And all this craziness is uh, we really need to double down and do more conservation efforts, get more into restoration and thinking in, in this different different way and kind of saying we'd like your help to, to, to strategize with us or get some other plans of actions. Did you notice any more uptick or any kind of uh, loopholes bubbling to the surface where you say there's really a need for this or more, more people coming to us at this time? We actually did see an uptick in people in companies reaching out to us instead of us reaching to them, which has been normally what we have had to do. And I think it's really driven by a number of things. One is the pause in the corporate frenzy of global travel, conferences, meetings. The corporate executives who make some of these decisions all had to pause. I have some board members who spend most of their lives in the air. And this year they have not been on a plane for a year. So allowing that space, breathing space and connecting that to how everybody at home connected better to nature, I think caused this realization of the impact of nature. But then on the more kind of pragmatic business side, we're seeing um, biodiversity now evolve as a materiality for business. So at the Davos summit earlier this year, um, the World Economic Forum listed biodiversity as a global economic risk that is highly likely and highly impactful right beside climate change. And that's the fourth time they've had it in that segment of their risk, risk matrix. So when we see the World Economic Forum driving biodiversity, then we also see the companies. So it comes from both sides, the personal and the pragmatic. Yeah, there, there was a couple of reasons, I believe, why we really saw that not only uh, is this year, there's a, a report that came out on biodiversity, but there's a biodiversity meeting this year. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really the theme. Well, a lot of people are kind of was swept under the rug because of the pandemic, so to say, uh, as right before 2019 and into 2020, um, Australia was having horrible fires, brush fires, and, and you know the images we saw were usually of a koala or a kangaroo and, and things like that. But the biodiversity that was lost there. Um, unfathomable. Just in one month, 85,000 hectares were lost in one month. Overall, to date, the numbers are still coming in, still going. Three billion wild animal species lost. Three billion. I mean, fathom that number. Seven billion tree species. I didn't even know seven billion tree species existed lost due to the brush fires. And um, their normal, Australia's normal emissions, carbon emissions during an average year is around 530 million tons annually. Um, they overshot that 650 million tons 
um, uh, uh, 650 million uh, uh, tons of CO2, which is about a little bit more, uh, uh, okay, sorry. It's about 650 atomic bombs going off is how much, which is 1.2 billion tons of CO2 during that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then we get into the pandemic and it's like, we've forgotten about that, that hit on biodiversity. And yeah, it, it happened in Australia, but that affects the entire world and people just don't realize that. And I know that for you, conservation, restoration, biodiversity are such vital things. And I, I really want to get into more depth on that and, and, and discuss it more. You, you touch on it in, in your book, but you also, I, I know you're concerned about it. Before we go too deep, I, I would like to, because a lot of my, my listeners, even though they're with the UN, the World Economic Forum, are still unsure about conservation, how it works, how, how to, to understand it. If, if, if it's a tool where re return on investment needs to come into play, if it's a tool that can get them allowance to work in certain areas that are normally conservation areas, things like that, that maybe would be considered greenwashing or bad business or whatever else. And I, I would like to first maybe get your explanation and, and, and um, definitions, why you wrote the book, why, how can we dispel some myths around this industry? And, and, then, um, and then I'll ask you the, the, the next question, which I, which I, from reading your book, I think is kind of, for me, it would, is a hard thing, but I wanna know how you deal with it, but I, I'd like you to answer those other ones first. Sure, yes. Um, and yeah, I mean the point about the loss of biodiversity in Australia is a very is is a is a thing to keep in mind. And that was the same with all of the big wildfires in California. Many rare and endangered species pockets of population were deeply impacted by those. So while the news stories are generally about the loss of life and the loss of income, there is another whole layer of loss that we see with respect to these basically climate driven um, events that are impacting our ecosystems. But to the book and the reason I wrote the book was to try to bridge a gap between traditional NGO conservation practice and traditional business practice. So these, the, the conservation groups and business groups tend not to talk to each other because they also tend to talk in different languages. So a driver for a conservation group is either a species restoration project, an ecological, a specific ecological restoration project. It's all framed within a conservation um, story. Whereas for a business, it's framed within a business driver. So when we speak to businesses, we try to engage them on why, on, on the challenges and the opportunities that they see that can be addressed with conservation. So I list 16 traditional business drivers in the book, social license to operate, um, regulatory compliance, employee engagement. These are all things that businesses can achieve using conservation. And what I would love to see coming from this book is that conservation groups begin to understand that. And instead of coming on site and saying, okay, can you just stop making steel and instead um, in completely restore these acres so that it's, pop, you know, it's for an endangered species, but instead come on the site and say, how can we help you to use your land better so that you can have a business um, a business win. And it's not a bottom line win. It's not talking about monetizing biodiversity. It's really talking about above the business line. And then for a company to become comfortable talking to a conservation group and not feeling immediately that they're going to be held to account for having a threatened species on their lands and for the fact that they actually make steel or make or mine copper or do all these things that the private sector does. So it was really driven to bridge that gap. And when we talk about, you know, um, the NGO world working with the corporate world, there is a spectrum of engagement that I view. One end of the spectrum are the sea shepherds and Greenpeace and the people sitting in trees still in um, the Pacific Northwest in the US are essential activists. They're essential as that, you know, wedge into the activism for corporations to behave better. 
But that spectrum moves right up to people who actually work in companies, driving companies to improve their practices for biodiversity. So companies like BP have, have ec ecologists and biodiversity um, staff helping them to move in the right direction. And I think that spectrum is really important. If we think about the ecological concept of response diversity, so the more resilient an ecosystem has, it has a diversity of responses. And if we look at our ecosystem of protecting and enhancing um, biodiversity, we also need a diversity of responses. So along that spectrum, every act is valuable, whether it's the sea shepherds, the, the advocates that are walking the halls of, of parliament, trying to get better biodiversity regulations, or those sitting in you know, the C-suites at the headquarters trying to advance it. So that's really how I view that world at the moment. Can you see some common myths in conservation or in your work with a, a, a conservation organization and working with corporates to, to get them or nudge them to, to start moving in the right direction, just from general public, their consumers and, and things where they say, oh, there, I, you know, I hear this myth about this, or even, even advocates or the activists who are on the trees or tying themselves or chaining themselves to, you know, pipelines or, or whatever type of construction projects. Um, do you see some general myths in there that you would like to dispel or, or that uh, um, people really haven't grasped or understood the other side of the coin? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of myths and a lot of, um, I guess, lack of systems thinking in terms of how all of these all of these businesses and companies are all connected together, which we know it's a global marketplace, it's a global economy. But one of my um, favorites is that the extractive industries are, of course, the ones that have the most visible impact on the planet and have a direct impact on biodiversity. Whereas the newer industries, like the tech industries, have a seemingly lower impact on biodiversity. But it's all connected along the chain, the value chain and the supply chain, because the products that are taken out of the earth by the mining companies are those that are used by the tech companies and the electric car companies that get a pass in many ways because of their impacts. So they're not paying the impact for their, on, for, for their impact on biodiversity, but the extractives are. And because the extractives have been doing this for a long time, they have one of the most sophisticated approaches towards mitigating their biodiversity impact and also restoring and rehabilitating afterwards. Whereas the tech companies get a complete and absolute 100% pass. If they plant 100 trees on their campus, they're lauded as being green. Yet at the same time, they're feeding into the supply chains that have an impact on the planet as a whole. So that kind of lack of understanding the value chain and the materiality of the impact along that value chain is something I think that um, we need a better understanding of. And, uh, and so we're, I'm going to go off a little bit on your book because you brought it up just now. In, in your book, you, you talk about true cost, natural capital, um, this total environmental cost uh, almost. Um, and, and that's what you're saying. A lot of these extractive organizations are 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 they paying that that true cost that natural capital that um environmental cost uh in the beginning or offsetting that properly in, in the right way but those organizations or corporates further down the line who maybe built the automobile or the computer from those extractive uh organizations that they're probably not as well, or uh, can you get us more into that flow and what, what your thoughts and feelings are, are on that? Because I truly, you know, I talk about this a lot. We, we need to pay the, the true cost, the total environmental cost, the, the, the actually almost the environmental cost as percentage of EBITDA, which has kind of been left aside for many decades. Yeah, I don't think any company is paying the true cost. I, I, I believe like you that, um, we need to incorporate the costs of the resources that not that they're extracting and the way they're extracting, but the resources that are being impacted by that. But I also believe it needs to go along the entire chain. 
we as a consuming society in the West, we are exporting biodiversity loss because the majority of biodiversity loss is happening in the rainforests and around you know, plantation agriculture that is all being produced to benefit most of consumers in the West. So we're really exporting that cost and it's not fair to the rest of the world. And it's always really interesting to me when we see Western governments asking governments that have rich areas of biodiversity to protect them. And I can't remember which country it was, but one country said, okay, this is what it'll cost you to protect it. And nobody ponied up the money. So we can talk about this, but we need to actually pay for it. But then the other side of it, you know, as you know, in the climate change world, there's scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. We need to have a scope three emissions policy for biodiversity because we really only have scope one right now with respect to impact on biodiversity. So that's why we're seeing, you know, the equatorial lending principles and all of these things impacting the extractive sector, but not the sectors further down that are using the components and then driving them out to the general public. So we're all of us not paying the value of the biodiversity loss. So I, 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 don't, I don't know how you do it. You, you've got to receive the saint, the angel award, the, 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 the prize for uh, diligence, because I, I would imagine, and in your book, you mentioned a few of them, some of the corporations and organizations you work or help or you're trying to, I see them as big evils, you know, I mean, I like the, the, the uh, I get just to say it nicely, and, and I'm sure some of my listeners do as well, so that very extractive organizations that uh, oil, coal, and gas, or automotive, or whatever, that just, I have a hard time sometimes seeing that. I have, one, how do you do that? And, and I'm sure I'm, I'm mostly wrong. Uh, they're not as bad as I probably am making them out to be, but I, how do you do it and what's that like and, and uh, why do you do it? Is there a, a real a method or kind of the trick? And I, and I know it's in, in your book, you kind of talk about that as well. There's, there's a method to why, why we need to have organizations get behind and, and change and be more involved in conservation, restoration, biodiversity. Mm -hmm, sure. Yes. Yeah, so at, at the Wildlife Habitat Council, we work with any corporation that wants to work with us. So many conservation groups have litmus tests. These litmus tests are not publicly available. We don't know what criteria are used. So we, for the sake of simplicity, decided, okay, if a company wants to do a conservation act, we want to make sure that what they're doing is the right one and what they're doing is sustainable. So let's build a framework for that and allow people with the resources to make the judgments as to whether they should be engaged or not. So our so we, we just took, that's a very simple approach and I'm a big embracer of simplicity in approaches. So when we work with a company like you, before I started this, to me, the corporate world was this behemoth, this anonymous behemoth. Um, that basically, you know, was responsible for all the ills in the world. But when you work with companies, what you're doing is working with people. And where we work in the sides we work with, without exception, the people we are working with want the same things that we do. Now, their colleagues in government affairs who are running around DC the last four years trying to get regulations changed are not the people we work with because we're not those, we're not policy people. But when we're working with environmental health and safety vice presidents, sustainability vice presidents, and um, increasingly, you know, climate people, they really want to try and do the right thing. And it's their job to try and push that rock. It's a Sisyphean task to push that rock uphill within their companies. And when that rock is met by the leadership with open minds at the top, we can really see change happening on the ground. And yes, we can wish for a world where, um, you know, oil is not being extracted, where cars are not necessary, but is that realistic? Is that realistic today? If, if a large um, industry just vanished, the repercussions right now in the way our society is structured would be quite severe across the world and not just in the places where the consumers are missing their consumer goods, but actually in the places where those consumer goods are also being made and moved 
So it's a really interesting conundrum. We, we've, we've built this engine that we depend on. We don't particularly like this engine very much. So our role at Wildlife Habitat Council and mine is helping companies view their impacts on the ground in a different way, but most importantly, to act. And that's one of our biggest things is we are biased towards action. And all we do is we, we don't help companies develop complicated plans that you know they can, they can shout about from the rooftops. We really push them towards action on the ground. I love that. And that's what I mentioned in the beginning of your biography and that I like the most, not only through the book, but I know from your work in, in the past and where I've seen you speak is it's really uh, important that, that we get people to act and to do something. Uh, and I, I've spoken about this before, that a lot of organizations and corporates, they kind of try to see how they can put environmental health and safety ESG or corporate social responsibility, or even the sustainable development goals, they try to plug them in as an add-on at the end of the year uh, on their their reporting or their year annual reports or, or, or whatever. Um, but there's no action. They kind of like do the year in review and say, well, how can we fit this into the year that we've just done, which is me it has no meaning. But if you start with actions, uh, uh, and this is what I hear not only in your book and uh, with other things at the beginning of the year really drive people to actions the employees the, the they rally around and they get excited and as you mentioned with your first story um, when in a time where they're in lockdown or really not supposed to be doing it they're like we want to keep doing this this is really neat and and a good project and it gives you the, the warm fuzzies, but it's also good for the world and environment. Um, uh, and so then they want to do it. And those type of stories are much easier to report on at the end of the year as well. And that leads me to, to kind of this next question. I saw, um, uh, it, I believe it was an interview, uh, and I don't know if it was for financial or not that you did um, on TV and the, I just, for me, it was totally brazen. They just come right out and say, so what's the return on investment of conservation? You know, um, Otherwise, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to do it if there's no return on investment. And, and I, I understand that because there is a way to get an economic model to be regenerative, to be restorative, to do conservation. That's actually a better business model. And that's the trend that we've seen um, in the last five years, at least, more companies and organizations working towards this net positive effect, uh, more um, planetary services, even though that's not their core business model. They like have a set facet in their organization and system that's a planetary service, leaving the planet better than they found it in some way, even if they're sometimes a horrible organization. Um, how do you deal with that? What do you tell people? What, 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 I mean, I heard what you said there and you did it so eloquently, but, but how do you respond to that where it's all about bottom line? What do I tell the board? How do we do this? Why, why should we do conservation? What do you say and how do you respond to things like that? Yes, it's always a challenge when a company has a culture that is focused purely on, sh on shareholder return. And, you know, the, the classic quote from Milton Friedman that a company's only reason, raising death, is to get, deliver a shareholder return. And that has been um, condemned, <laughs> proven wrong, and has been shown to actually impact, negatively impact companies. So companies today that are seen to go beyond an ROI and actually have an SROI, such as social return on investment, are seen to be more valuable. We, we did a funny um, exercise a couple of years ago where we actually made a stock index from our members and it outperformed the main stock indexes on the New York Stock Exchange um, because it was a collection of companies, first of all, diverse companies, but also companies that all go beyond compliance in their activities um, across a spectrum of sustainability objectives. So if you want a good stock index, go to our member list. Um, so when, we, when a company just wants return on investment, we talk about risk 
we talk about the advantage of risk mitigation through conservation action. So not getting your permits pulled, getting your permits easier, um, you know, having a frictionless movement through the operations world will save you money and it will reduce the risk to your operations. So when you're really thinking about those hard dollars and cents, it really becomes a risk assessment exercise. But that question is becoming less and less common for us. We have seen, Wildlife Habitat Council has been around for 30 years. I've worked here for eight years. And even in eight years, we have seen the conversation change from reactive, we did something wrong, we need to fix it, the government's breathing down our neck, to proactive, we really want to sign on to the Business for Nature Coalition, we really want to have our conservation work aligned with our SDG goals, we really need to get on board with the upcoming financial requirements for biodiversity reporting. So we're seeing that mind shift and seeing it accelerate over the last few years, which has been really good. So the, the ROI question becomes less important. Yeah, and that, so I, I figured it's also something that more media tends to focus on than than uh, the, than the general organizations and population. Uh, um, would you say that that's the the differentiating thing is one the action, uh, uh, two more the the uh, the kind of focused on strategic planning that's involving action to drive them, or or is there even more than that? You said that sixteen drivers. I, I want to tease your book a little bit. I don't want to give people the Cliff's notes or give everything away. So I, 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 if you want to talk about the drivers, we can, but I'd also like to kind of, uh, if you don't mind teasing a little bit what the differentiators are um, from this to some other approaches or past approaches. Mm -hmm. So there are a large number of um, commodity specific conservation approaches within forestry, within agriculture, especially around palm oil and within fisheries. And also moving out into say luxury goods and jewelry where they're very focused on the specific commodity, um, a tree, a fish, et cetera. So our approach is neutral on the actual operation, on what the operation is doing. It's more about overlaying a blanket of conservation um, opportunity. And it's trying to link what happens. It's, it's also understanding that a company is not the corporate headquarters. It's actually where the stuff is made, the stuff is extracted, and the stuff is moved. The corporate headquarters, the guys who go to Davos and are members of WBCSD and come back with the great ideas may drive it and may support it, but it's the guys on the ground, the EHS people, the site managers who actually do it. So what we've done is create a model that connects that locally valuable work into a corporate headquarters value for reporting and storytelling. So by creating a consistent approach through a strategic conservation plan, a test track for General Motors in New Mexico and uh, you know, an auto body place in Korea for General Motors, they can all contribute to General Motors statement on their biodiversity action at their facilities, which then feeds into General Motors SDGs. So the really the, the differential for us is that whole neutrality in terms of the actual operation. So we really just figure out, you know, where are you in this world? What's your conservation context? What's your land holdings? What are your resources and what can you do for that? and then help those in corporate HQ to connect those dots to tell their story. So uh, I'm probably gonna ask you to de for define for my listeners EHS. And, and um, I told you earlier, I know what it is, but I told you earlier um, that I used to work uh, for renewable companies and um, did health, safety and environment work. Um, I'm actually an OSHA certified instructor. And so I know I, I trained other, other people um, in, in um, OSHA standards. And so it's, that kind of ties into it, but it really went kind of 
health safety environment. It went uh, uh, occupational health and safety arena to compliance, to corporate social responsibility, to um, ESG now. I mean, and it's kind of taken this journey over the years. And uh, it's something what I, really what I think we're trying to keep up with our exponentially growing word. We're, we're trying to catch up to where our conservation, our restoration, our regeneration, and really living within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. But I would, I would love to kind of get a little bit more of, of that verbiage and have you explain that more. And, you, you know, it's not, not the CEOs who are, you know, they might have the big vision and hopefully do, they do. And it's not just a lot of lip service, but it's those who are directing and leading that on different locations around the world mm -hmm. uh, for those organizations. Yes, yes, and I apologize for using EHS as a, just a term, I forget sometimes, but environmental health and safety is a core operating principles of most companies these days. Uh, the majority of companies that we work with have basically safety goals that are higher than most safety goals structured by governments. Um, they really have a very, very low risk tolerance for any safety issues on their sites, which is always fascinating as a somebody coming from the NGO world to actually go onto an industrial site and learn about the safety goals there. The health goals, of course, the same with respect to their employees and with respect to the communities in which they operate in, which they've always not, they've always not been the best players in that arena. And then the environmental goals, which are really driven in US by EPA and of course across Europe by the various um, regulations from the EU. And while safety has been grabbed and ran with to an extent of safety is such like most meetings will start with a safety minute where people will talk about safety. We now have seen companies start with an environmental minute where they will start talking about environmental issues and especially conservation. So one of my goals is to get the E in EHS as important as the safety, because the safety for most companies has gone way beyond compliance, but the E has stayed within the compliance only mode. So that's one of the challenges that we have. And it really is on the ground. So yeah, the CEO can support it, can lead it, can drive it. But when we worked with General Motors, for example, they established a goal back in, I think it was 2010, maybe, that they would have all of their manufacturing facilities worldwide engaged in conservation action. That was established from their headquarters. The people on the ground never heard that. That story didn't get to them. So no action took place until we created a framework for action that again joined the dots from the C-suite to the factory floor. And by creating that framework for action and putting the people on the ground in the story and helping them to design the efforts, we were able to move from zero sites engaged to 75 sites worldwide, working towards conservation objectives for General Motors. So the ground is where it's so important because that's the only place it's gonna happen. You know, we need to move earth, we need to restore ecosystems. You can't do that from the top floor of a skyscraper in a corporate headquarters. Yeah, and it's, in that respect, it's always kind of been a really tr a trickle down because so the, the big settings come from the government and from the corporate side and OSHA or whatever standard it is, EPA. And then, like you said, at most, most construction sites or most industrial areas, they, they used to begin really, and I, I taught all my employees at first, you know, it was a safety meeting at the first, you know, one to five minutes where let's have a safe day, let's all go home safe with our eyes and fingers and personal protection. And, and then there was a little mention depending on what area or, or what was happening that day on, okay, we need to be careful that we're not, um, taking any outside substances into this area or encroaching on this, these bald eagles, or uh, we've got some species here that need to be moved or protected while we're in this area, stuff like that. And, and I, I, I've been away from it for a while, but I hope it's starting to more focus on the environmental thing. And we've realized 
we're going to go home with our, our eyes and our fingers that by the end of the day, but we need to make sure that our biodiversity and, uh, and our species are there um, moving forward uh, so that we can have a beautiful regenerative ecosystem to live in. Um, you you kind of mentioned in your book about bird species um, and climate and climate crisis and things. Um, why are corporations so uniquely positioned to help mitigate biodiversity loss? We cannot get to where we need to be with respect to biodiversity loss without private lands. Um, we don't have enough public publicly protected lands and there's these drives for 30 by 30 30 percent of the world protected by 2030 which is getting a lot of pushback from many corners of the conservation community in terms of equity of impact so we need the corporate sector um, we need the corporate sector because they have the lands we need the corporate sector because they have the resources and we need the corporate sector because they also have the impacts so you know you can enter into a conservation program in a protected area where there are no uh, pressures on the ecosystem, where the ecosystem has been restored and management is happily, happening along a predetermined best management practice. But when you move and pivot to work with the corporate sector and you're working with an operating steel mill to create habitat for you know, uh, ground nesting birds, it's a whole different approach and different way of thinking about conservation. And what makes it really interesting is the human dimension is just as important as the biodiversity outcome and the biodiversity actions. Whereas if you're thinking about a protected forest, that's really all about biodiversity. So you're getting a co-benefit because you're engaging people and you're giving them ownership over a, a result that they may never have had the opportunity to do. But without the corporate sector, we cannot get to where we need to get with respect to leveling out the biodiversity declines that we're seeing at the moment. I think in some respects, this is what I hear out as well, that you're almost, con you're connecting these corporations back to the earth, back to the lands that they own, but you're also uh, their employees and, and connecting people back to the earth and these lands. A lot of us are feel disconnected from this biodiversity loss. You know, it's happening somewhere else, uh, but it's actually happening all around us where through the organizations we have, um, we, we've just been kind of dis disconnected through the encroachment of cities and organizations and lands and things or that the, the production or extraction done by those organizations is somewhere else than the headquarters where the majority of the people work and, and that connection's never really made on, on that. And so I, I like um, that because it's, uh, I like how you describe it too, because it's getting people back to that bigger picture, the bigger understanding on how, how everything really ties together. Mm -hmm. um, the, I, I used to do this a lot when, when I was, <clears throat> and I, I do now still, but in a different way, um, how you gauge with these local and communities. So uh, and, and corporates really, um, back then they used to have specific people that go around months before projects or anything would occur and kind of engage with the communities. We've seen that over the year, not all, uh, over the decades and in different films with, not only with farming, but in uh, energy and pipelines and different things where they're trying to convince people before they go in and, but only, so they could extract and then disappear and people kind of left in ruins. Uh, that has changed a lot over the years. And um, how can uh, failing to involve communities um, really hinder plans? Or do you also see that that's improved over the years or do we still have a lot of work to do? Mm -hmm. I think community engagement has become much more sincere um, than it ever has before. I think the body of research and work on stakeholder engagement has helped to inform companies in how they can be more honest, more authentic when they engage, but also, and most importantly, that they listen, that they're not just paying lip service to what the communities are saying. Now, there's huge environmental justice issues, especially in, in the US and in old industrial neighborhoods where companies have had 
impacts since before EPA was created, the Environmental Protection Agency was created, where materials management protocols didn't exist and where what we call Superfund sites are still causing toxic issues in the communities. But what we're seeing from cleaning up Superfund sites right through to developing new um, operations is a whole different level of community engagement. Is it where it needs to be right now? No, it's not, but it has gotten much better. And recently we've seen coming out of the Biden administration, a big focus on environmental justice, which is going to drive, I think, much more deep and meaningful engagement in the communities in which companies are having an impact. And it's one of the things that we're trying to drive with the companies is if you're taking actions to uh, mitigate your carbon, your climate impact by investing in offsets in forests elsewhere, start at home first. Take a community first approach to what you're doing. Okay, you won't get the carbon sequestration you're looking for, but why not make nature-based investments in your communities before you start making them in communities elsewhere? And I think that's a real message that we can bring home to companies um, that, are, that are impacting those communities. So you're originally from Ireland, you're living in an, or working in Washington, DC. Um, uh, I have this question that I ask everyone. How do you feel about global citizenry and a world without nations, borders, divisions, humanity, one from another? <laughs> that is such a great question. And it um, this morning before we talked, I was on a call with some um, colleagues looking at a series of properties that a company wants us to come up with a conservation strategy for. And I was just reflecting to myself how humanity loves to draw lines where they shouldn't exist and how these little squares of land exist in places and borders are the same to me. I mean, I feel like I am a global citizen. I'm, I, I'm a dual passport holder of Ireland and the US. And I feel like, um, you know, why do we have, nature doesn't have boundaries. Nature has its natural boundaries. So I certainly, I like the idea of a global citizenship and um, the ability of freedom to move and freedom to move from areas where your livelihood and your life is being threatened. I think, you know, I think that is a good thing. So I, I, I don't want to get off into Brexit, but, um... Uh, Ireland and Scotland pretty much weren't on board with with the the Brexit. The reason I I, I kind of touch upon that is if you look at the extraction or the global touch of the United Kingdom of uh, their footprint, so to say, around the world of extraction of food or energy or, or, or resources that does not occur in the United Kingdoms. It, it, it's all over the world. And it's actually, I, I think they, they said this uh, last, uh, in 2019, there was a, a, a footprint report that came out says it's five times the size of the United Kingdom in space and land and footprint that they use somewhere around the world extracting resources. And, and we're, we're all breathing the same air. We're all drinking the same water. We're all on this spaceship earth. And, and there is no place to hide from uh, climate change, or there is no place to close our eyes to biodiversity loss, but there's also no way to, to, to I mean, even if we do close our borders, even if we do make crazy decisions to get out of certain things, um, we're, we're all sharing these same resources. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm the same way. I'm from the United States. I live in Hamburg, Germany, but I'm, I look at it more as like the realities of, of resources and and you know that how how that works and I love how how you how you put that and that the the biggest the very probably the first uh, global citizens that I could think of is, is business the way business works and uh, before that probably colonialism or something you know how how we kind of just made sure that we were trading and working with people and and doing good, bad, and ugly things uh, all over the world. But we are, we need to come up with some, some better way to work or understand how the world works. 
even if we don't have that global citizenry thought or that where we're say we're all connected uh, in one way or the other, if you look at the way business and organizations, corporations work, there are actually already global citizens. That's a, a corporation's almost a, like a global passport to work and, 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 and do trade. And um, whether borders close or not, that, that trade somehow is always hacked and there's, they find ways to, to get it done anyway, you know? So uh, thanks for answering that. And I, you know, I just always like to kind of the bigger picture of, of why, the reason I lead in that direction is because in 2018, um, the entire world's international organizations kind of made this very direct shift from a siloed linear approach to solving our global grand challenges, human suffering, global grand challenges, climate issues, environmental issues, to this systems view of life approach, this systemic approach to solving our global grand challenges. The United Nations started setting up um, all these systems dynamic models and, uh, and how the spider web of the SDGs and the Paris Agreement kind of tie to some basic pillars and, and transformations that the world needs to go through, but that they're all tied together. We can't just work on one one alone. And the World Economic Forum did, did so as well. They kind of set up these transformational maps on their website that if you go to them and you click on conservation or and um, certain industries or agriculture, it shows you that spider web of a system of every other facet that touches and ties to that industry. And um, you, you brought this up um, just in, in your prior question before we got on Global Citizen, you said that there's these super fun sites. Uh, I don't know if my listeners know what that is, but I definitely know what it is. Uh, and I want to kind of explain explain it. Um, a lot of companies or organizations will go in and just kind of use a piece of land or property um, till they can't use it anymore. And they've it created so much waste or sludge or um, leftover of whatever they were doing, whether it was extractive or they were producing some kind of a product there, that the site turns actually into this unusable dangerous hazardous place and then they just say okay we're gone and they leave it for someone else to clean up or uh, sometimes not even have the responsibilities in germany i've dealt with a couple locations for my organization where um food believe it believe it or not food companies uh matter of fact i'm going to even say which one granini a super fruit and vegetable vitamin drink company here uh left this this Place, just abandon it says we got to find some other place that's cheaper and better this place is has so much sludge from the processes of their of making their drinks that it wasn't for 15 years till anybody could move in there and, and use it or, and, and do it and that thinking of cradle to grave we use something until we can't use it anymore we've extracted everything we've left garbage and waste there and then we go find some other place that's this cradle to grave mentality, but the circular economy, this biodiversity, this conservation of those places that we work is this net positive that, that I believe that corporations and organizations need to move in. And I believe it's in the first part of your book. You talk about Andrew Winston uh, and uh, you also mentioned Unilever a little bit, but Andrew Winston, he's been on my podcast as well, but he and Paul Pullman from Unilever are working on a new book called Net Positive. And they're kind of trying to move in this direction. How can we leave as business, as corporations, as organizations, leave the planet better than we found? It? Instead of doing the bare minimum, instead of doing the OSHA regulations or the EPA regulations, just make sure we meet those. Why not take the higher road? And, and go above and beyond and, and offer planetary services, say, no, we want, and, and there's been some organizations that have done that as well. Microsoft in, I think it was 2020, came out in January, 2020, it says, since we've been in business, we want to remove our historical carbon emissions. And I'm like, that's unbelievable. Most people didn't understand 
remove your historical carbon emissions since you've been in business? That, that, that's unheard of. That's a step beyond in the right direction, kind of trying to leave the planet better than, than we found it. With um, your strategic conservation planning, the 16 steps and, and everything you, you uh, talk about in your book, how do we think we can set the bar how, higher for organizations, corporates, to kind of get on that same wavelength that it's not just the bare minimum that we're required to do or because there's no other way around it, but that we actually set the bar higher, go above the bare minimum and leave the planet better than we found it. What, what's your thinking? Or I mean, It kind of it ties to, in general, what, what you hope your outcomes for this book and also your thoughts would be over time, because I know it has to do with a lot more restoration, biodiversity and things as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there, when you talk about systems approach, we need a systems approach for nature. And while we talk about Microsoft rolling back its carbon credits, Microsoft is still managing its data centers without any approach for nature. And you know they will say, well, we need to stay in compliance with whatever. But there's 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 a way of talking and a way of doing. So when you make these large commitments, uh, they that get the headlines. Can we just dig down a little bit and actually see how you run your operations? So in my world, you know, if I was king, I'd be like, let's let's start with your operations and then allow you to build up to making these bold global statements. But unless you are living in harmony and working in harmony with nature, yes, you can be, be investing in these offsets and carbon offsets all over the world, but you're still having an impact on biodiversity. Because in my view, we all have an impact on biodiversity. Every time we, we consume anything, every time we walk outside and drive our cars, we're having an impact on biodiversity. So companies, Toyota is a company that has a global goal to live in harmony with nature. Um, over, the, I can't remember what year, I think it's their 2050 or 2030 goal. And I think that's a really interesting goal because it's thinking about your relationship with nature. And it's, it's beyond climate, it's different to climate, but it's really thinking about how you go to work every day and where you work, is that in harmony with nature? And are your operations in harmony with nature? And how are you offsetting the impact you're having for nature? So that's the shift we need, but that shift needs a system change from the incentives that are allowing companies to destroy nature that are actually in some cases impelling them to destroy nature by ridiculous you know, um, requirements around fence line maintenance. And so there's something as simple as that um, through to customer um, expectations that the public should be crying out for um, companies to live in harmony with nature as much as they cry out for other things like no GMOs or other things like that. But we should all be asking for these things. There should be public pressure. There should be a removal of government subsidies around nature. And then there should be the corporate world that wants to live in harmony with nature. And I think only then will we get to where we need to get to. I love that. I love that. And, and really, none of these initiatives, none of the things you talk about in the book, they're really esoteric outcomes. They're reality. They're, they're just better operating systems. They're more, not only more people-centered, human-centered, humane-centered, but also um, the outcomes are just better models for operating. And um, they, they not only tie us back to the land, uh, wherever we're at, but also tie us back to the earth as, as global citizens. I love, I love how you, you eloquently say those things in your book. And I really believe that as the subtitle is, it is a, a meaningful guide to engagement that you, that you really can use the tools, the, the 16 different, um, business drivers really to to get into the depth and substance and to do it right and no not not every one of us are, are working as conservations or conservationists or restoration or in an organization 
Well, every one of us eventually is faced with some form or another to restore, regenerate, or, or, or to do something for our local community and, and involved with companies who, who might be um, where we can purchase our products from or where we can let our voice be known to nudge them or to help them to, to think of things a little bit differently. So I really thank you for that. Um, I only have four more questions, big questions for you. Um, <laughs> Maybe five, I lied, I have five more. Um, the, the hardest one I'm going to give you is the burning question. And I give it to all my guests. It's the burning question, WTF. And most people are like, oh, it's the swear word. Uh, um, I've been saying that a thousand times during these past 12 months of lockdown, but it's not. Uh, it's what's the futures? And so from you, for you personally and for the work you do and the organizations you work with, I, I would like to know what you're, if you were king, if you were the super one, what's, what's your vision of the futures? That's a great question. And um, my vision of the future is the, when you think of a cinematic dystopian universe, dystopian world is the opposite of that. So, I see what I want to see is a journey where you're starting in the business district of a city. And in that business district, the skyscrapers are clad with nature, that nature is incorporated into the design and the way that Singapore is doing it and other cities or biophilic cities are doing it. And as you move to the edges of the cities, the residential neighborhoods have canopy equity where there's tree canopy in the poor neighborhoods and the rich neighborhoods where the industrial edges are managed for nature. And as you move further away from the city and into the suburbs, the corporate campuses no longer have lawns, but are actually forests and meadows and supporting biodiversity. And the suburban subdivisions are no longer planted with invasive landscaping species, but actually host immense amounts of biodiversity. And then as you move further out into the countryside, agriculture is regenerative. Mining is reduced footprint and is managed in a reclaimed way that actually enhances biodiversity. That is my future world, and I would really love to see it. You believe that um, for, for a lot of cities, so um, urban planning restrictions or um, requirements for, for headquarters or organizations to really do that within cities is do you do you believe that's a hindrance or a restriction at this point or that that if it wasn't kind of because of zoning or city restrictions that maybe more organizations would do that as well in their headquarters where there's no extractive work going on i do i believe that our urban planning shorts nature i think that urban planning or planning schools in general need to have modules on um, biophilic design or biodiversity in urban settings. Because if we're looking at an increasingly urbanized world and we want to protect nature, we can't have nature as somewhere else. It has to belong where the people are living because that's good for health, but it's also good to understand how it all works together. Um, one of my favorite authors is Jose Saramago from a uh, Portuguese author who's now passed away, but he has this dystopian novel called The Cave, where the agriculture is created in one place and where all of the people live in a shopping mall and there is nothing in between that. And when you think about that world, it's devastating. It's a devastating world. And that's not the world that we want. But I think urban planners would lean towards putting everybody in a shopping center because it's neater and it's tidier and it's easier to do the infrastructure. But I really think planners need to kind of somehow get better with nature. Uh, I totally agree. I think it's, it's, it's all over. I mean, we, we're seeing some cities kind of getting up to speed with with different um, planning restrictions, changing their zoning, changing the way they can do things within city boundaries. I mean, one of one of my friends, Ron Finley, he really had a hard time planning these sidewalk gardens and kind of did. He called them the, the the gangster gardener. You know, he was putting 
fruit trees and planting food right on the sidewalks and in different places and ran into some zoning and issues with in California and Los Angeles. Um, but, but here in Germany, we see, you know, people wanting to transition to regenerative agriculture or agroforestry and there's restrictions in farming where you can't have uh, trees mixed with farming. And it's just absurd. Uh, a lot of these systems or these planning rules these that we have, they're just outdated. They're not thinking. And, and a lot of these cities are creating some extreme hot zones, some dead zones where it's extremely hot. There's no fresh air, no circulation, no shade uh, from trees. And if we rethought that and kind of let let organizations get a little creative. I think, boy, we'd have have a big switch. So I'm glad you brought that up, and I, I hope that uh, we can have some thought leaders and governance and and that kind of help us around the world to shift shift the future of our infrastructure because that's a big the built environment's a big part of uh, infrastructural change that will help us reach the future. Um, the last three questions I have are really for my listeners. They're uh, uh, Messages that kind of help them uh, on their journeys or empower them to to live better lives or to do better things. If there was one message that you could depart to my listeners that is uh, uh, a st sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be? Your message. The mantra we have at Wildlife Habitat Council is every act of conservation matters. Now we adopted this before. The Black Lives Matters movement, so I apologize for the similarity, but the intent of it is that conservation is does not have to be the realm of the professional with the PhD from the Yale School of Forestry. Every act of conservation matters, whether it's me planting a milkweed for monarch on my balcony in Washington DC or somebody moving to native landscaping on their corporate campuses every act matters. And I think that's a key thinking when we're talking about nature. What would you define your, your title as? I mean, what, what, what do you have like a, a besides a president of, of uh, your conservation group or council, what, what's your, what would you say? Are you an activist? Are you an advocate or? That's interesting. Um, we, we played a game recently at a staff meeting where we had to come up with um, our own job titles after Elon Musk changed his job title to, I can't remember what it was, Techno King. Um, so we decided we'd come up with ours and my came up with mine as environment, you know, cheerleader for nature. And it was just a very funny, you know, story about how that's what I do. I go into corporate offices and I'm cheerleading for nature. I don't have pom-poms, but that's what I'm trying to do. So I see myself as an advocate, but not in the traditional advocating to government, but I'm advocating to the private sector. So my entire job is selling nature to the private sector. That's all I do five days a week. And I really enjoy it because, you know, when you're telling stories about nature, there is no downside to that. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, the real reason I asked that is because what, what should young innovators in your field of evangelism, cheerleading for nature, naturists, naturalists, uh, conservationists be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a, a big and real impact on our world? That's a great question because traditionally, um, young people who moved into nature-based work become wildlife biologists or ecological restorations. But there is an entire world in the private sector that brings in a suite of expertise um, to advance nature. And that's the type of thing that is about all about communications, about being not being um, just focused on one species or one landscape, but being able to understand nature as a whole. And I think that is an absence in the education system around environmental science, because really environmental science puts people in these very narrow canals and they sail that canal boat to the end of their um, career as a professor or somebody in a wildlife agency. But a all rounder is somebody who can really help in the world today and see the connections between climate, biodiversity, the SDGs, 
um, whatever it is, and be able to talk about those. That's where I would advise a young professional who wants to go beyond a special species to think about. That's beautiful. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? <laughs> Oh, wow. I don't, I'll have to think about that. Um, I work in a very male dominated world. And um, I wish I had had the confidence to speak up in that male dominated world a lot earlier than I achieved it. Um, as a female in that world, we tend to um, try to build up our knowledge before speaking, while the opposite can be true um, in the male dominated world. So that's something that I wish we have a saying here sometimes when we're writing our bios, can you man up my bio so that we write them like a man would? <laughs> and that's been quite an experience for, throughout my career is working in, in a field that is pretty much a male dominated field is, is, is being present and um, being confident as a female. Well, that you, you've just made me uh, throw in another question. I'm sorry. So <laughs> I, I, I tell all my listeners and, and, and anyone I, I speak to at different events or presentations that the top three ways, in my opinion, and, and knowledge is um, to draw down, to solve human suffering, to fix our global grand challenges and environmental problems is one, to globally reform food entire food systems secondly and thirdly is to empower women and girls and i totally agree with with your answer my to, to my kind of last uh question and that's because now i've added another one but in that respect are, are you doing things in your work as president but also to empower women and girls how because that has a big part of conservation throughout the world, if women and girls are not sold off to marriage early, if they're not working on the farms or toiling in a family business instead of going to school, getting educated, if they're being paid a fair wage, um, on and on. I mean, I could go into a dozen other, other things. They take better care of our world. They take care, better care of our families. They feed us, us better. And, and it's a ripple effect that can benefit the world. And as Paul Hawkins says in, in his uh, book, Drawdown, by the way, just as a tip, he's got a new book coming out in September called uh, Regeneration. And it's the sequel to the Drawdown. Um, he says, empowering women and girls, 75% ability to stop human suffering and solve our global grand challenges, uh, really to to, to flip the switch on our world. So uh, I, I, the last little caveat, maybe you could give us some words for the girls and women and for what, what your thoughts and feelings are besides the question you answered. Sure, yes. And I think there's a flip side to that question of being in a male dominated world is having a female voice makes you heard in a different way. And you can deploy that voice in a different way. You can actually talk about things in a more human centered way than a traditional male kind of upbringing and socialization allows a man to do. So to me, it's leveraging that ability to be emotional, to be passionate and to be proud of that because I think that's how you can really get messages across. One of my big heroes is Mary Robinson, first female president of Ireland, who is so vocal on women and girls within the climate transition and how important that is. And I really love what she says. We have little capacity where we work to impact some of these things, but the things that we do do are definitely share the mic. All of our conferences are, we, we strive for gender balance. Um, even though we have a male dominated world, we strive for gender balance on the voices that we bring and increasingly trying to bring in racial diversity. My world is also very white. Um, so really trying to think. And when we do a lot of um, STEM education with our companies that use their conservation projects for STEM education in the communities, and really thinking that through um, gender lenses as well to make sure that the engagement is, is, is just as appealing to girls as it is to boys. 
but yes, I mean, there is, um, there is, there's an upside to being a woman in this, and that is because your voice is different and is heard in a different way. And using that and leveraging that and not being afraid of that, I think, is very important. Although I'm uh, have this long curly hair, I'm, I'm not as good a voice as you are, and it's always <laughs> like, why, why is Grandpa telling me about? empowering women and girls but i really appreciate those wise words and i hope uh that through through our discussion here today that you've empowered and uh some people to look at the world differently in form of conservation and, and strategic corporate conservation planning i loved your book thank you so much for sending it to me and taking the time to discuss with me i recommend it to anyone who really wants to find 16 great tools to to move forward and lots of other wonderful wisdoms and um i thank you that's all i have for you i appreciate your time well thank you so much for reading my book and thank you for all of the great questions today you're most welcome i hope we can do it again soon okay thank you take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.